what is your view as a former Chancellor of the current row about the Prime Minister's tax arrangements? I think uh, David Cameron has himself admitted that he's made a mess of the, his handling of it. Uh, but I think it's pretty trivial. There are more important issues behind it. This arose out of the revelations in the so-called Panama Papers. Yes. And this shows beyond any shadow of doubt that international cooperation nowadays needs to be global. The idea that it can be just European is crazy. And the idea that you need to be a member of some political entity or union in order to have international cooperation is also completely mistaken. Brilliantly taken towards the European argument, but can I just ask about the, the tax haven issue generally? You know, in the world that evolved out of the 1980s and the relaxation of exchange controls and the liberalisation of the financial system, which has brought many benefits, it has also allowed lots of people to hide their money away from any uh, uh, national tax authorities around the world. Do you think we now need to see a big international effort to start to crack down on these tax havens? I think there does need to be international cooperation, as I indicated a moment ago, and it has to be completely global. That is very necessary. There is a fair amount already. Uh, the Revenue and Customs, when I was in charge of it, it was called the Inland Revenue, mm. but they cooperated very considerably, and of course they need to do more. Uh, the, but the, the abolition, pretty well, worldwide, of exchange controls has been a huge boon. You would not have had the development of the so-called emerging world as rapidly as it has been if there had not been freedom of capital flows to those countries in the early stages in particular. So it's done a great deal of good and nobody in their right mind wants to unwind that. But there does need okay. to be uh, cooperation between the tax authorities all around the world. That's right. Let's move back to the European issue. As I was suggesting, this uh, £9.3 million expenditure on a leaflet and website and so forth to persuade people to stay inside the EU has offended a lot of people on your side of the argument. Do you think you're fighting on an unfair playing field? I think a lot of people who haven't made up their mind particularly uh, feel that it's outrageous that this propaganda leaflet should be put through and it is pure propaganda, uh, pretty worthless propaganda, uh, put, for, put to, out in the government's name with the civil service behind it at the taxpayer's expense. I think many people feel that that is a scandal. So we know that there's going to be an amendment put to the finance bill, I think, tomorrow um, on this subject. Is that the kind of thing you would support if you were still in Parliament? I'll have to have a look at it, but it might well be, yes. Mm -hmm. OK, let's move on to the sort of substance of the issue. And one of the big knotty problems we've tried to discuss in this programme is whether or not we would be in a single market after leaving the EU as an institution. What's your view? It's not important. Uh, it is the... Fortunately, we live in a largely free-trading world. Mm. That is due to the way that the world has developed uh, over the past 20, 30 years, and it's due to the efforts of the World Trade Organization. And we live in a pretty free trading world. The, uh, the common external tariff, the weighted average, as they say, 5%, is, is so. no, it's between 3 and 4%. It's mm -hmm. between 3 and 4%. That's the official figures. And that is trivial. The currencies move more than that. The, uh, what is striking is that trade from outside the European Union into the European Union has risen much faster than trade within the European Union. You don't need to be within the single and market so to issue, trade. Really. It's not an issue. What, one area it might be an issue for, of course, is farming, where the agricultural tariffs have been much higher coming into the EU. And one of the things we haven't really talked about very much so far in the debate is what this does to British farmers, because I think 60% thereabouts of their income now comes from EU subsidies. And the question, therefore, is obvious, is to, if we leave the EU, should the British government pick up that kind of level of subsidy, which is very, very expensive, or not? Before we were in the EU, there was agricultural support from the British government. We've mm. always supported farmers, and the question is how much you do it. And I'm quite sure that if we were to leave, as I hope we will, the European Union, first of all, nothing will happen immediately, straight away. Mm. There'll be a transitional phase, but uh, that there will be support for farmers. So, so, so the, the, the British taxpayer should pick up, I think it's about 2.8 billion in terms of, of support for, tax, for farmers, it's a lot, but you would support that. What are the British, what are the British taxpayers is doing now, at the moment, is not only paying for all this European support, Mm. Uh, all the things that, that the farmers get from Europe are British taxpayers' money. All the things that the scientists get at the universities from Europe are it British goes, taxpayers. It, it goes it, it's just recycled. But we are paying £10 billion a year more in 
than we get out. So if we're out, we'll, we'll be able to afford so, more. But if you have influence, because there are a lot of farmers watching and they're having a very, very tough time at the moment, if we vote to leave the EU, they will be protected. They should be protected. It's for the government of the day. and I'm not a, I will not no. be a member of the government. My government Advise days are over. Kindly on this I, my government days are over. But uh, I'm quite sure, and I think that that is the position of uh, those who are uh, in the cabinet who are mm. in favour of voting leave, is that the farmers must be supported, yes. Now, you're hostile to the EU, but you're a Europhile. You live in France and yes. so on. What, what about the, I think there's more than a million British people living on the continent at the moment. Yeah, and there are huge numbers of people, uh, French and other Europeans, living. Living, living here. There's not going to be a great exit, there's not going to be objected no, well, on what, neither side. There are legal protections anyway. I was going to ask they are about legal protections. protections, the Vienna Convention and other legal protections, but uh, there is no, nothing to fear from that. So those there people are a lot who of, may be watching... Of, from, in France, where I live, mm. there are quite a few Americans who live there. Yeah. And America, as far as I'm aware, is not part of the European Union. Absolutely not. But if, if you're watching this programme from a longer dock or wherever, and you're worried about, your, for instance, the, the, the mutual arrangements on health care mm. um, or recognising professional qualifications, those kind of things would be renegotiated post leaving the EU. Yes. Uh, and, and, and they would be, they would yes. be safe, in yes. your view. All right, one final area we haven't talked about, which is what happens to the border between North and South Ireland. It's a 310-mile border. If we leave the EU, and we are therefore completely outside the EU, and we want to control our borders, as many people who want to leave the EU do, surely we have to control that border as well and close it. We have always made Ireland a special case, uh, long before we were in the European Union, even though the Irish Free State, as it was originally called, when it got its independence in 1922, I think it was, uh, was different. We, we have always, we've allowed the Irish, for example, to vote in British elections. We don't allow anybody else uh, who's not British to vote in British elections. No, the, uh, the Irish are for historical reasons a special case, and they will remain a special case. The, the Anglo Irish Irish relationship is, is, is a very, very special relationship and it will continue to be so. It has been ever since uh, Irish, sure. Irish independence was secured. Some people, would say, I, some people would say that is a back door to migration into the UK from the rest of the EU and the rest of the world. Well, that can be stopped. There'll be, they, they can be border... Uh, there would have to be border controls. There would be border asking. controls, but not a, not a prevention of genuine Irish from coming in but the, the, crossing be the border. On those and, it, and there will also be, which is even more important, as there is now, uh, particularly close cooperation mm. between the security services in Northern Ireland and the okay. security services in the Republic to prevent the IRA and the terrorist threat from being worse right. than it is. All right, just one very, very quick question. As somebody sitting at the centre of this, how do you think the, the pro-leave campaign is doing in terms of the, of, of the likely outcome? How's it going? In terms of the arguments, uh, I think the pro-leave campaign is winning them all. In, term, in, term, in terms of votes, uh, you have to see how, how strong this un, totally unfounded fear campaign can start. There's no campaign you know, to love the European Union. That no, is conspicuous that. by its mm, absence. Mm. So all they're trying to do is scare the pants off uh, of everybody about leaving. But it is crazy. The, the, the most of the countries in the world are outside the European Union yeah. and they're doing very nice. Thank you.